Today I'd like us to go and derive the sine. So it will be symmetric across mu. This is easy. We could ignore the constant term, meaning we should end up getting the exact two identical terms here at the bottom. Now, two things you need to recall. You need to recall the chain rule through this graph over here. So all you have to care about is the linear term. So solving this, we truly get that x equals the mean. Hello everyone, it's a special video today. I want to go and look at the normal Gaussian distribution, which is basically used for bell curving, a lot of grade scores and stuff amongst other applications, but it's very famous. And today I want to look at some properties of it involving symmetry and differentiation. And overall, I want to split up this video into there are three main parts I will cover today, which is to show that, number one, this distribution, since we know it's a probable distribution, I'm just going to shorten it to PDF. I want to show that this PDF is an even function. Show that this PDF has an absolute maximum at x equals zero. And finally show that the inflection points of the PDF are at x equals plus or minus the standard deviation. And as you know, the standard deviation is a measure of the spread or variability of your data. Now, if we were to go and take a look at what that looks like on the normal, on the most simplest case of the normal distribution, you will have a bell curve that is centered at the origin, but this peak over here, which we will show is indeed zero, is the mean of the distribution. The standard deviation or the inflection points, therefore, will be the distance from the vertical axis to this point on the positive quadrant of the curve, and then minus the standard deviation will correspond to this inflection point on the left-hand side of the curve as well. All right, so how do we define the normal Gaussian function? It's very nice. I'm going to put it in the most simplest form possible. A Gaussian function is a function of the form of any constant a capital a multiplied by the natural exponential function of minus c x squared so you basically have an exponential decay but it's decaying at an x squared rate and you have a little constant c in front of it as well now this is if it's centered at zero, mu equals zero, with sigma equals one. Now the A, which I was show in the previous video involving the multivariable integration properties, is going to be one over sigma times the square root of two pi. And C, on the other hand, is going to be 1 over 2 times the standard deviation squared, or the variance in this case. The standard deviation squared equals variance. And now, um, 
if we didn't want to restrict ourselves to this restriction that mu has to be equal to zero and sigma has to be equal to one, well, we could always transform x into the z-score, into any kind of like z-score, which is basically you take your arbitrary point on the distribution curve and you translate it by some arbitrary mean and divide it by the standard deviation. That's the definition of a z-score. So if that goes into here, we will get x minus mu over sigma squared. So that explains at least where the sigma squared in this comes from. Now the half, on the other hand, I don't quite understand myself other than that that's just the definition. Otherwise, I have to think of if you have a half, it's so that since we're dealing with probability, we want to take a look at the equal measure of probabilities of success and probabilities of failure. So we always want to go 50-50 chance on that. That's the only reason why I could think why we decided that part of our C is going to be a half. And let's get to the meat of this now. I want to basically show that, first off, that this PDF is an even function. And I'm just going to leave it in terms of A and C so I don't have to write everything out all over again. That's why I'm using those nice constants. Um, but basically to show that a function is even, if you were to put in a negative input, you should basically get that that doesn't affect the function at all. Get the same thing back. And that should be apparent from the fact that this function is being squared. But let's show it step by step. So f of negative x equals a times e minus to the minus c times minus x squared. That whole thing gets squared, becomes a e minus c x squared. That's exactly what we started up with. So therefore, it is f of x solved. And as you can see from the picture, it is indeed symmetric about the vertical axis. If you were to fold it in half, if we were on a piece of paper, it would evenly, the curve would evenly sit on top of each other. So that's this done. Okay, this one requires a bit more work. Show that this Gaussian function has an absolute maximum at x equals zero. Well, first we have to differentiate this function. Since this is an exponential function, when you take the derivative of an exponential function, you get the same thing back. But since there's stuff up in the top, in the power, we have to use the chain rule. And hopefully you should see that we end up getting with ae minus cx squared times minus 2cx. And if you want to put that together, that could be minus 2acx e to the minus cx squared. And in order to find a critical point, we naturally have to set this equal to zero. But here we essentially have a linear factor or a polynomial being multiplied by an exponential part. An exponential function can never cross through the horizontal axis. It's always a horizontal asymptote. So we are allowed to ignore this part and purely focus on minus 2ACx. But then once again, minus 2ac, those are constants. So if you divide it, you get that x equals zero. So we indeed have a critical point in there. But now we have to show that it's a maximum. And how do we do this? Using the second derivative test. So this function that we already found here, e minus c x squared, I'll keep this up here as f prime of x. We have to find the second derivative now. Since we can break it up into a polynomial part and an exponential part being multiplied, to find the second derivative, you have to use the product rule. And so this will become, well, since this is broken up into parts, we're going to get 
this part as one derivative, spit back right out, minus 2ac x e to the minus c x squared, and then it's going to be added by some unknown stuff. Now that's going to be the derivative of this guy times this being fixed. So this is going to be minus 2c times a e to the minus c x squared. And now we can factor that out to get minus 2ac e to the minus c x squared times x and then let's see I'm oh, sorry. Let's make this a bit easier first for me. I think I can factor out all at once. So we can factor out the exponential part. We get e to the minus c x squared times minus 2ac x minus 2ac. Okay, cool. And now we can factor out, we see we have a common factor of minus 2ac on both sides. That just becomes minus 2ac e to the minus c x squared times x minus 1. But we want to set this equal to 0. You can see that we have an inflection point at... Wait, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's for later. That's for later. Okay, that's not quite what I have written here. Sorry, my apologies for the delay. Ah, okay, I'm sorry, I see where I went wrong now. It's minus 2cx, that remains fixed. So I only put 2c into 2cx, and now we take the derivative of that again, which becomes exactly what we got here, which is minus 2ac x e to the minus c x squared. Is that right? Yep, yep, now we're good. Now we're good. And that, for my work here, if you factor it out, is e to the minus c x squared. You can factor out and then this becomes 4a c squared x squared minus 2ac. And we really aren't concerned with the second derivative in general, but we want to examine it when x equals 0. So when x equals 0, you have an exponential function raised to the zero power. That's, we don't care if stuff multiplied by, that's always going to be one. And now we have 4ac squared one minus 2ac. And I put one instead of zero here. Don't know why, but that becomes 1, this becomes 0, that's minus 2ac, which is minus 2ac, which we understand is a negative number. So if the second derivative is negative at that point, that x equals 0 that we found, that has to be an absolute maximum. <laughs> so we're done with that, nice and easy. Now the last part, find the inflection point. Well, let's not waste what we've already done. I'm going to keep this work I have over here of this second derivative function that's back out here. And now I'm basically going to set this equal to zero. And so for that, that's how you go and find the inflection points. So 
I'm going to move this up to here now. 0 equals e to the minus cx squared times 4ac squared x squared minus 2ac. And now, as usual, we can ignore the exponential part, this guy, and purely focus on this here, linear part. So 0 equals 4ac squared x squared minus 2ac. And now, typically, what you want to do is, yeah, I think overall you would rather want to factor. So this becomes 2ac times 2c x squared minus 1. You always want to do this just to, I mean, technically you could add 2ac and then divide by 4ac squared, but then you might be missing out on a certain factor. So that's why I always prefer like factorization first. But anyhow, it's up to you. I think it doesn't change regardless. So that, and you get, we can ignore the 2ac constant, so you get 2c x squared minus 1, which just becomes 1 over 2c equals x squared, which means, which implies that x equals square root of 1 over 2c. Mm -hmm. And remember, I said that over here that we define the c to be equal to 1 over 2 sigma. So if we plug that right into here, we will get square root of 1 over 2 times 1 over 2 sigma. And that becomes, well, that's 1 over 1 over sigma. So that just becomes, oh, sorry, sigma squared. That becomes square root of sigma squared. And remember, when you're taking the square root, there's always a plus or minus. So that just becomes plus or minus sigma, which was what was to be proven. So yeah, that's why I decided to let our constants equal two simpler constants, A and C. Because imagine if you have to go and do this with the general form of everything, you, you, you get a giant mess. And in fact, I think I made a previous video on this, um, typing up works on Microsoft Word, and it, it, it looks ugly. So this, I find, looks a much more cleaner, elegant, and crisp. And yeah, uh, on the side note, I've only shown that for the case in which mu equals zero, that the PDF is an even function. But that really shouldn't matter in a loose sense because if you were to go and translate the function onto a different point, it shouldn't affect the derivative. So basically I'm saying that derivatives are invariant or they don't change under translation. I actually looked at an article somewhere which says, no, technically that's not true for certain cases. But I think uh, the normal distribution is not a bizarre, or put it in a way, a pathological function. So we can ignore that and safely say that, ah oh, yeah, this works as well for this. So yeah, that's it. That's the video done. I'm the proof essayist. I hope you enjoyed this. Please like and subscribe and comment if you have any other questions. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.